Hey, David Brewster here with a new episode of Soloing Secrets, and this is a huge one. Frank Zappa, and I have to totally admit, I was very intimidated putting this episode together. You know, listening to his music and compiling everything and watching, you know, footage. And it hit me. Like, this is huge. And technically, you know, we just made it through December. And December of 1993 is when Frank passed away. So we just passed the 30th anniversary of his passing. And that was on my mind all, all year, last year. Like, yeah, this is, you know, the 30th anniversary and I wanted to put this together, you know, technically last month, but things got crazy with the holidays and camera upgrades and whatever. So I just did the Weasels, you know, chord play. And I have done a chord play in a 3 for all for Frank. And now we're going to basically do a deep dive into some of Frank's, you know, elusive soloing secrets. So here we go. Much like we've done in other episodes in the Soloing Secret series, when you're checking out a certain musician or band, it's always a great idea to scope out their influences and find the musicians and artists that influence them musically, because that will reveal, you know, some of their habits and secrets and things they like to do in their music. And with Frank, I mean, it's a giant list of jazz musicians, classical musicians, rock musicians, very diverse and very random, too. But here's an image with some of Frank Zappa's elusive musical influences. And then as far as some of the people that Frank worked with in his career, there's a huge list of musicians that worked with him directly in his band, or they contributed and kind of did session work, you know, behind the scenes. And then there's a whole bunch of other people too, and not just musicians, artists and painters and dancers and all sorts of stuff, you know, worked with Frank and filmmakers and all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of people, you know, and you have to think Frank's career technically started in 1955 and then continued until 1993. So there's a lot of years there of working with, you know, a random assortment of people. But here's an image with some of the people that, were, you know, Frank worked with in his band directly. Or they kind of did guest appearances. But keep in mind, there are hundreds of other names that aren't included right here. So as far as Frank's actual soloing secrets, the things he typically liked to do when he'd pick up a guitar and play a lick or a solo or whatever, and there's a lot, once again, here. You know, there's a lot of things that he did. He was a very random and kind of spastic and just spontaneous musician, you know, free-formed improvisation, you know, all the time. And, you know, you never really knew what he was going to do when he'd pick up a guitar or play a solo or what his band might do as he's directing his band to do something. And, you know, a very inspiring player, very different approach, too. Very left field, you know, dissonant tonalities and targeting non-chord tones, you know, and stuff like that. And just finding really interesting, you know, musical chances all the time. And there's a lot. But here's an image, you know, kind of revealing some of Frank's, you know, musical secrets and soloing secrets. So the music and ideas featured in this episode came from four Frank Zappa-related albums. And keep in mind, you know, in his lifetime, he released 62 albums. 62. And he passed away in December of 93. And since 1994, they've issued 64 additional Frank Zappa-related albums. Some of those are compilations or live albums, but still, what is that, 126 albums? That's a mountain of music to climb. So we're going to basically target very specific things, you know, in Frank's playing style improvisation, um, just this kind of spontaneous composition that he was definitely, you know, very well known for, um, modal vamps and kind of playing, you know, modal ideas over a chord progression, targeting, you know, some unusual notes, you know, kind of getting away from targeting the root and stuff like that. So we're going to hit some areas, you know, within Frank Zappa's musical world. So instead of, you know, like learning licks note for note and really trying to, you know, copy him, we're going to basically copy some of his compositional techniques and his overall approach. So here we go. All 
Alright, with the opening jam, that was basically me playing around with Willie the Pimp from Hot Rats. And don't compare my solo to anything that Frank laid down on the album Hot Rats, because my solo was nothing like Frank's. I literally just played an improvised, spontaneous solo, which I think Frank would approve of that. Instead of me trying to copy him, I just did my own thing. And none of that was worked out. The riff is from the song, but then the solo I played is just kind of spontaneous. I knew I wanted to target that B note, and I knew I wanted to use the open G somehow, and everything else just kind of happened. But uh, let's talk about that. We're going to talk a little bit about improvisation in this lesson, which that's actually a very hard thing to teach. It's also a hard thing to learn, too. But we're basically in A for that riff. <laughs> minor pentatonic bass basically and definitely Frank liked using you know minor pentatonics and blues scales hybrid pentatonics that was one of his specialties was taking a pentatonic and then he would dress it up with a bunch of additional notes and passing tones and chromatic notes so he would use you know, pentatonic a lot but then he would push it into other you know scales and tonalities too so for that you know, we could basically kind of pinpoint some of Frank's favorite scales, like the minor pentatonic. We're in A, right? So let's just take, you know, A minor pentatonic right here. Right? A minor pentatonic played like that. And you can see there's the A, C, D, E, G, A, right? And you could definitely think of the box if you'd rather do it that way. To kind of break out of that box, let's do it right there. Right? So that's just regular minor pentatonic in A. You could convert it into the blues scale by adding the flat five, add that E flat right there. Right there. And so there's two E flats right there. Right here. And right there. What about Dorian? Definitely Frank liked using Dorian a lot. It has a very distinct jazzy sound, and that would be right here. So there's your A, B, and C. And that F sharp right there into that G. Alright, so there's minor pentatonic. The blue scale. Frank used lots of other scales too, but over this particular jam, you know, Willie the Pimp, that's probably what he would gravitate toward. Either pentatonic and blue scale based, you know, riffs and licks, uh, dip into Dorian. He definitely targets, you know, B a lot in his solo. You know, and that kind of, you know, breaks you out of pentatonic because that B note isn't, you know, part of A minor pentatonic, so that kind of gives you an extended sound. And, you know, that F sharp is definitely going to bring out more of a Dorian flavor in A, right? So definitely I was targeting a lot of F sharps and Bs, you know, in the opening jam. And I was shying away from that root note. I wasn't targeting A that much. I was targeting a lot more B and F sharp action. So go back and watch that opening jam solo again. Or listen to Frank solo, you know, in the song, Willie at the Pimp, and you can hear that, that avoidance of the root, it creates this tense, you know, kind of, you know, tension. And then finally, when you hit the root, it kind of, you know, relieves some of that tension. And sometimes Frank would just keep going with the tension and never, you know, release it. And that's very interesting, something to think about. Now, as far as note targeting, which definitely Frank was a master at targeting over certain chords and chord progressions, you know, hitting the right note at just the right time, or he would sometimes purposely hit the wrong note at the right time, just depending on his mood and what he wanted to do. And I'm actually going to borrow a little bit of what we looked at in the Music Only Has 12 Notes you know, rant video that I made. I think that was like two weeks ago. And we're going to basically arrange this on a single string like we did in that lesson, mainly so you can see what we're doing. And we can definitely do this in one position you know, across the strings, but sometimes when I'm trying to flesh stuff out, especially like this, it's beneficial to look at it, you know, on one string. It almost kind of mimics like the layout of a, a piano where you can really see, you know, what you're doing. So let's just, you know, we're looking at A minor, you know, for Willie the Pimp. So let's just lock into A minor right there. And let's just think of like the triad, like the A minor triad first, A, C, and E. So there's A, 
right? We're gonna basically bypass these two notes to get to C. So remember those two notes right there. There's your A to C. Then notice the notes that we're not playing when we basically move up to that E note. You know, but also notice there's some notes we're not using right there. So there's A, C, E, and then all the way up to that A octave, way up there. Now we could definitely do this in one position right here. But you can't really see what you're doing when you do it across the strings like that. I mean, you can see it, but you don't really see the space between those notes. You also don't notice you know, the notes that you're not playing like that. You know, there's obviously, like I said, there's two notes in between you know, that A and C. The same thing between you know, the C and that E. There's three notes right there. And then once again, you know, that final stretch right there, there's four notes now. Right, so let's investigate those additional notes. Think of A minor 7. Now we're just going to add a G, right? So that's the open G string. And then also, you know, way up there, that G note right there. Now what about um, like the minor pentatonic scale, okay? If we think of A minor 7, we're just one note away from A minor pentatonic. So think of the minor pentatonic box. A, C, D, E, G, A. Let's do that. And there it is. A, C, D, E, G, A, right? What about uh, A natural minor, like Aeolian? There's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, right? Dorian, you know, one of Frank's you know, favorite modes there from the major scale. Same scale. But now we're going to be targeting that F sharp. Right? So this is really just kind of forcing you to think about the notes that you're playing. And once you get away from the, the chord tones, right, like the root, the third, the fifth, and the root, or even that seventh in there, you can start thinking about those additional notes that we're not playing, like the second or the ninth, which is that B note right there. What about the fourth, that D? You know, if we're thinking Dorian, that F sharp, which would be, you know, like the, the regular six. And you can just start kind of thinking about what you're doing and kind of mixing those notes together, creating melodies and stuff like that. Once you've done it on a single string, then you can start doing it you know, obviously across the strings too, right? So that just kind of fleshes it out and then you can really work it out, you know, kind of moving across the strings and kind of, you know, basically shaping that all over the fretboard. All right, let's dive into some of these targeted ideas, but let's move away from Willie the Pimp and we're gonna move into Watermelon and Easter Hay, which is from uh, Joe's Garage. Definitely a legendary, you know, Frank Zappa guitar song and moment, you know, beautiful tune. And this is gonna reveal some of Frank's modal sound beds where he would, you know, compose a song and arrange this kind of modal, you know, vamp. The band would loop the vamp, and then he'd grab a guitar and just freeform, you know, play a solo over the top of it. Sometimes those solos might be a minute or two. Sometimes it might be nine or ten minutes of him just going crazy. But with this, it's really just a two chord progression. It's, you know, kind of arpeggiated, you know, painfully slow. It's A major right here. And then E major seven sus two. seven sus two you know, producing this very distinct kind of modal you know flavor so I'm gonna use the MXR clone looper again to kind of help me out so here's the backing and I'm gonna basically start with Frank's kind of intro to the solo here like this so there's the backing and this is from you know the actual song right here Kind of playing 
know, between those two chords using that really simple melodic statement there. So that's watermelon and Easter hay, at least the beginning. And then he just starts going. And, you know, there's some approaches you could use here. And definitely, like I was mentioning earlier in Willie the Pimp, definitely Frank liked using pentatonic scales, almost like a, a basic roadmap or guide, but then he would dress it up and fill it out with a lot of additional information and ideas. So for that, you know, for that progression, you could definitely target, you know, E major pentatonic or E Ionian, you know, as far as what's played over the E chord. But then there's something interesting that happens, you know, if you keep using that same scale, when it changes to A, that's where you really kind of dip into a different modal flavor. So it starts with A right here. Just think, you know, E major pentatonic to start with. It's actually A Lydian. There's the A. And then there's the E right there, right? There's the A. kind of let the chord progression do a lot of the heavy lifting and work you know I'm just locked in the same scale and then the chord progression changes but I'm targeting and pinpointing you know notes that are relevant to E when it's E right and then notes that are relevant to A you know like whenever the chord changed to A and like I was mentioning there I don't know if you could hear it with the backing and everything while I was talking over it but over E, that would be E Ionian, right? But over that A, then it magically becomes A Lydian. Right? Just that change in the chord kind of shifts Ionian to Lydian. Something else to think about. Here's another example of this kind of modal vamp, you know, popping up in Frank Zappa's music. And this came from Black Napkins, which is from the album Zoot Allures. Definitely another one of my favorite, you know, Zappa guitar moments. And it's really just a two chord progression, but it's setting up this modal, you know, kind of flavor and, and vamp to where you can basically kind of do what we were doing in the previous example from Watermelon and Easter Hay, but now it's Black Napkin's turn. So it's C sharp minor seven right here to D major seven, right? the backing you know r rarely was ever you know complicated or crazy usually it was pretty simple and then Frank would throw all the complexity you know on top of it with the soloing so usually the sound beds or the modal vamps in the background were usually kind of sparse and ringing or arpeggiated or something so with that um, you know as far as finding like the parent mode or like where that came from you know C sharp minor 7 to D major 7 that basically came from A major or A Ionian <laughs> That's the parent scale. So A major gives birth to, you know, this technically C sharp Phrygian and D Lydian is what we're playing with there. You know, that C sharp minor seven is kind of producing like Phrygian, right? And then that D major seven is producing Lydian flavors. So over that backing, like that chord progression, you can kind of play with that. You could target C, you know, C sharp Phrygian over the C sharp minor seven, and then D Lydian over the D major seven, like this. Kind of hear it. shift and that chord progression is totally making that happen you know one minute at C sharp is your root and then suddenly it's D is your root right and that's a 
a very important component of modal music and composition right there is letting the chord progression do a lot of the work. All right, last but not least, this came from Inca Rhodes. This came from the album One Size Fits All. And once again, we have this two chord kind of modal vamp happening. And once again, another classic Frank Zappa guitar song and moment here. And as far as the chord progression, you know, once again, he's letting the chords kind of do a lot of the work for him. It's really just C major seven to D seven, right? And there really isn't a guitar playing that. The bass and the keyboard are kind of what's leading the charge. And then Frank, you know, is playing this extended guitar solo. But that's basically what's implied right there. C major seven to D seven. So if you have your modal thinking cap on, then we can kind of reveal the parent scale and kind of investigate like, what are we doing here? So the modal, you know, kind of parent scale is gonna be G major. Because G major spawns C Lydian. And also D Mixolydian. You know, which come from G major right there. So what that means is you could basically target, you know, you could think of G Ionian or the G major scale, target C, target D. You could think C Lydian over C and D Mixolydian over the D and just kind of, you know, branch off from there. Start building your melodies, you know, whether you're playing over the C chord or you're playing over the D. You can kind of end your phrases depending on what, you know, tonality you're kind of targeting. So since the bass is kind of leading the charge, that's what I'm kind of using here as far as the backing. So here's, you know, the, the ba kind of raw bass, you know, modal vamp. And I'm just going to play scales at first. So here's, you know, C Lydian played over the C section. And then D mix Lydian. target and hit. But that's really eye-opening to kind of investigate the chord progression and then realize like, wow, I can just play the same scale, but depending on what chord I'm playing over, sometimes I need to target that C. And sometimes it's the D. Right? And that's really eye-opening and interesting to kind of get in there and really notice that. That's going to wrap this episode of Soloing Secrets with this look at Frank Zappa. Definitely a very, very important guitarist. Very, you know, highly influential. Influenced millions of people all over the world. Whether it was guitarists or composers and musicians, songwriters, vocalists. I mean, look at somebody like Weird Al. Weird Al totally loves Frank Zappa. I mean, obviously he loves Dr. Demento and stuff too. But Frank's influence literally is everywhere. You have to look for it. I mean, in certain players, it's very obvious. You know, Steve Vai, Mike Keneally, and people like that. But like I just mentioned Weird Al, you know, that kind of humor and that uh, sense of humor and kind of adding that to music, it's kind of a lost art because in today's world, it seems like everybody's so serious and everybody, you know, they don't want to be laughed at or whatever. But in my mind, it's like you have to kind of lighten up a little bit, maybe laugh, you know, if something funny happens or maybe something sounds funny or whatever. And for me, like when I listen to Frank Zappa, it's liberating. It's like, wow, okay, all that stress and pressure and all that's taken off. And you can just enjoy the raw music, emotion, you know, his sense of humor, quirkiness, and some of the weird stuff that he would put in his music. It's very inspiring because you're basically taking all those rules and everything and throwing them out the window, even though you're remembering all those rules. But, you know, there's like this childlike kind of reckless abandon in Frank Zappa's world and his music. And I love that. You know, it's, it's definitely sorely missed in today's world, too, I think. But anyway, leave some feedback and comments. Please subscribe to my lessons, and I'll be back before you know with more content and material. Thank you.